So good morning everyone and uh, as for those who were here last week I was talking on <coughs> the Tenakus Lakamas in the section, the second part of a talk that I gave a couple of weeks previously <coughs> and uh, just trying to conclude it with uh, how, uh, how uh, <coughs> once we've established in, uh, in our practice of sila, how it naturally unfolds into Maitri Bhavana or loving the practice of uh, Metta, <coughs> Metta Bhavana, practice of loving kindness. And so when we've uh, established that, there's also uh, uh, things to uh, consider when we are developed in, uh, in uh, these two qualities or continually developing these two qualities, I should say, because it's an ongoing thing. It's never going to be completely stable. There'll be ups and downs in one's practice in these uh, practice of sila and practice of metta is uh, something we constantly have to be uh, reminded of and have many challenges to, uh, to look into to keep us on, um, on track. <coughs> So as I uh, started from the previous talk, unconfused, clearly comprehending, ever mindful, pervading the one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. So these are fourfold, so it doesn't mean we do each one, but these are fourfold. So we might start off with uh, loving kindness, and on another occasion we'll be doing compassion on another occasion sympathetic joy. Sympathetic joy meaning I've been thinking about that, contemplating how to uh, give a clear uh, modern understanding of that context because it's very, uh, people say, uh, joy are others, uh, success, but it's more deeper than that. I see it more uh, uh, harmonizing with all people and that's truly what uh, is lacking in the world, this sense of harmony, harmonizing seeing there's conflict and straight away eliminating that conflict in every situation and this is the you can see very people uh, in the Buddhist world have got very good excellent practice you see there is no you see them at work or at their skill they have uh, there's no conflict such as this great uh, Kubajan Lumpoplim who passed away this February who I got a picture of to uh, uh, show my gratitude towards um, staying in his monastery prior to he he uh, abandoning his uh, five khandas and uh, the masses of people that would come to his monastery just huge amounts and uh, you think there'd be a lot of problems but it was very harmon harmony lots of harmonizing and uh, lots of different people with different needs and expectations in their practice some just wanting to make great offerings some wanting to have a quiet, peaceful place. And they, even though it was a very noisy uh, affair having so many people, but uh, it, they quickly harmonized and quickly created a conducive environment for practice. So this is what I mean by this quality of mudita. Is, uh, it's a very special quality because the other ones don't really talk about this quality of harmonizing. It's more like we're giving a sense of there, there is problems, there's lacking, lacking of goodwill. So we're giving metta, goodwill, where there's lacking, there's a lot of cruelty, we're giving compassion in those situations. But here, we can't say, oh, this, uh, when other people are succeeding in life, we're wishing them, wow, you know, that's a bit uh, limiting. So I looked at it, I explored it in my practice, and uh, through my own research and studies, came to this conclusion, it's more quality of harmonizing and, uh, and this is very true because once we've established this harmonizing, it leads to a very equanimous state, equanimity. So if we're very harmony, then there's no conflict with ourselves, with others. We can easily be at ease and peaceful. It's like having a very loving environment such as this center. We come into this room, it's very quiet, it's conducive for meditation. It's just we're here and now with our own mind and body. And, there's, and we're just working with that in a very peaceful way, getting much uh, energy and harmonizing with, with the group, having the group support. And as we know, when we do uh, group sit, such as on the Tuesday night, how powerful it is when we have a group sit, 
we feel we can do a bit more, go a bit deeper in our practice when if we're by ourselves, it tends to be a bit, you know, a bit difficult, you know, we get distracted and so forth. I'm not saying that we should never sit by ourselves, but it's more once we're established in our practice and we're quite advanced, then it's very nice to sit, as we say, Lord Buddha says, secluded from... Um, from unwholesome states. So meaning that when, when, we, when we are very established in our practice, there's no disturbance in the mind and we can easily sit regardless if there's a group there or not. So then he gives a beautiful list uh, uh, of uh, talking about pervading the first quarter of uh, loving kindness and, uh, and this quality of loving kindness is uh, uh, unconditional love so we are having this warmth affection so we're generating if we can explore our meditation we're not and it's on a basis we can see maybe we're not expressing metta but the very fact that we're sitting peaceful is in the fact that is within the element of metta that is a quality of metta in itself being peaceful i i uh i had a critical i was very critical as a as a many years ago about a lot of particular Pali words and having some uh, discussions with some senior monks in Thailand about this point. And they said, when there is established this peaceful state in the mind, then there's not this need to think, oh, now I should project goodwill. I have to now think of projecting metta to everyone, metta, kindness. It's already apparent in the mind because there's no disturbance in the mind. That is the quality of metta. It, it's a quality of harmlessness. There's no harm on oneself and there's no harm on others. So, and, so sometimes we study so much, we read these suttas and things like that and think, oh, I'm peaceful, but I'm not producing metta. But you see, this is just, it's just the, how we say, it's the access stage where the mind is stable and not disturbed. And this is where it's starting to go inwards and develop much more deep, peaceful states. And, uh, and that can be expressed uh, in, uh, in, uh, around us. And this is how the Lord Buddha disguise, disguise, discusses it or uh, describes it. Likewise, with the second quarter, third quarter, and the fourth quarter, starting off with the first quarter. So in each division, you know, in, in uh, the north direction, the south direction, east and west, so forth, each direction, um, there we are, we are giving this quality. There's no way, it's not saying... Uh, uh, to the north where my enemy lives, I don't have any metta. This is what it's really trying to say. In a certain area, there are dangerous people I'm afraid of, so I don't go there. That's what it's saying, that every direction I have no hostility. I'm quite ease with myself and others. So this is what the Lord Buddha is implying with that. Thus, above, below, across, everywhere, and to all as, and to, all as to myself. So then this is a quality of that it comes back to us. What we're expressing outwards, it comes back to us. So this is beautiful. I, I often explore this. Is this true, what the Lord Buddha is saying? Is this true, what he's saying about metta? Because this is the ex, what we're reading, Karaniya Metta Sutta, that, that is the qualities of development in our daily activities, daily lives. It's someone who has metta. It's a descriptiveness of it. But there is another sutta where he talks about particularly the bhavana state not what we're exploring with our body speech, um, but it's more on a, on, a, on a level of our mind in a state of bhavana, mental cultivation development. And so once we, once we look at that, we can say, oh, this is very true. It's very subtle. But if we are very refined, we can see this is actually happening. This is a process that is actually happening. This is actually correct. And this is what the suttas are and the Pali canons full of, these descriptions of when we are peaceful, we will experience these states, we will start to see it. But if we are still on a very critical mind, we're thinking, oh, is my meditation going good, is it not? It will never kick off because we're always undermining our qualities and that is a very unwholesome state. So it's really we have to develop this non-judgmental to ourselves and others. And, Lord, and what is that? What is that saying? That is saying harmonizing again. Because with a judgmental, how can we be harmonizing? We're creating all these descriptions around the world about ourselves and others. So really, one of the most fundamental important qualities, I think, is mudita. It's very undermined. Everyone says metta, you know, express metta, metta. 
And why people so much obsessed with this word metta is because that is what is truly lacking in the world. And the Lord Buddha did say that what upholds the world is uh, maitri, metta, loving kindness. This is what holds the world. You can say, you know, the world is hold it in space, but that's not necessarily so. The Lord Buddha says once metta is taken away from this world, from all people don't have any metta anymore, then the world degenerates very quickly. And this is what he talks about when the, the end of the world or when the world starts going to great... Uh, 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 to uh, the, the human race starts to go degenerating incredibly, where the life lifespan of the human race is uh, reduces. We're now we're at 100 years, but believe it or not, it can extend up to something like 80,000 years. And at that state, the the human minute the realm of the humans only have I think uh, I think something like five illnesses, and this is uh, just and these are just bodily daily functions. There's no such things as cancer and this and that. It's quite in a, quite a, uh, uh, so that we can see the, the world system, the vastness of time and uh, even science has started to being uh, mind boggled by it all, trying to understand uh, where we are at the universe. They've only come to one conclusion that the universe is actually expanding and this is only one particular phase in, uh, in uh, the uh, in the, the, uh, the quality of uh, an eon, as we say in the Lord Buddhist uh, terminology, an eon has four, four, four main principal states. So they have, there's a quality of the boundlessness of the universe, because that's what it's, what it's saying. And another section of it, uh, uh, he understands that it's the uh, entire world, so it dwells pervading the entire world, abundant, immeasurable. So in another, he understands thus, that it's uh, that it that these qualities are immeasurable and uh, and uh, abundant, exalted, measurable, without hostility, without ill will. So there, so they these states that go into these far-reaching areas of the world and also within ourselves. So it's this this quality which the science has come to also understanding. There's these two worlds. There's the external universe world, which is uh, which is so. Uh, far and wide they can't you know it's measureless almost you know and uh, the size of the universe they say is what they consider it's eightfold if in that is short what they think is infinite it's also plus another eight times i've heard in and in, uh, in physicist circles and uh and and also that the uh the inner world as science goes more inner to the micro level of the world it gets even more smaller and smaller you know and uh and this is why we have this term nano, nano at the moment, which is this micro uh, robotic uh, engineering that they're working on, building these small micro robots that they can be implanted in the human body to do certain functions. And they say it's like having a size of a, sh of a whole suburb. And they are just like a, like a, a little, little insect in that suburb. That's just to give an understanding how small, how tiny they are, how insignificant they are, and they can, they can work on that level. Even that, that's huge. They consider that that's not micro enough. It's so deep, the inner world, as we go deeper inwards. So there's this expansive world, and there's this inner world. We go deeper, go smaller and smaller, minute and minute. So, and this is... Uh, where we're saying that, you know, we can break down atomical particles to photons and so forth. But who's to say it's even more minute than that? It's just to showing the level of our instrumentation of science and a limitation of science to actually understand the universe. So when we are sitting in meditation, we don't have to think about all of these technical terms, but we can experience that quality of this boundless quality when we are deep, when we're definitely in a peaceful state. <clears throat> And so then, uh, in the particular, this uh, uh, one of the uh, teachings that the Lord Buddha gave on metta, he's saying that uh, these qualities here, he understands previously my mind was limited and undeveloped, but now is immeasurable, well developed, and no measurable karma remains or persists here. And so then, <clears throat> once we've developed. Our, our, our sila and our and our and our qualities of metta bhavana, it has the quality of uh, of attainment, one of uh, anagami, 
So if we're just going on this way only, the Lord Buddha says, if we are not doing other forms of practice, if we decide to just go this way only, it can reach to a very high state where we're not, you know, uh, investigating uh, anicca, dukkha, nata, but we're going just purely in this direction. It can lead to a very high lofty states. And, uh, and then the mind will naturally be ready for deeper penetration of, of noble truths, uh, not coming, returning to this world. So I was just showing the power of, uh, of, this, of this practice of, uh, and it's in line with Dharma. Once we are ac accessing these four Brahma Viharas, we're on the, the path of Dharma, you know, it's going that direction, There's the surety of it. Because once the mind is at level, it will naturally start to see the three characteristics as well. It won't need to go that way because it will be understanding. His mind will be very uh, well concentrated in understanding of, uh, of what uh, is the reality of life. <clears throat> and so the Buddha talks on about what do you think? Because if a youth were to develop the liberation of mind by loving kindness and, uh, and also so forth with the other three qualities. So if the youth were to establish these... Uh, uh, these uh, ten kusala karmas, um, or decide um, being interested in the confidence in the Lord Buddha's teachings, uh, kind, generous, well-mannered, composed, inclined to harmlessness, abiding in peaceful states of these four Brahma Viharas, from his childhood on, would he do a bad deed? And the monks say, no, Bhante. Could he suffer suffering effect if he does no bad deed? No, Bhante. For what account could suffering affect one who does no bad deed? And thus meaning there is no remorse, no regret in the mind. And this is what, what is our problem, why we can't calm down and settle down. We have this remorse, regret, and this uh, not being able to uh, uh, be at true peace with ourselves and others. Meaning we, we lack wisdom. The reason why we have remorse and regret is because we have lack wisdom to understand what is the right course of action and what is the wrong course of action you know, in our behavior, in our modes of daily existence. So we, the Lord Buddha is asking us, these ten kusala karmas are complete in, the, in, in this sense. They are the path to deliverance and they are within the Noble Eightfold Path as well because they govern our body, our speech and our mind. And if we look after these three areas, then we're, we're on the path to a surety and security. <clears throat> And this is the problem when we do not recognize suffering and its causes. It's the nature of desire and attachment. It leads us to unprofitable states. Nor understanding, is it possible to abandon such states? So due to being an unentrained worldling, he cultivates harbors, no confidence in the triple gem, or has poor conduct in behavior, or both these qualities. So lacking confidence in the triple gem and having uh, poor conduct and behavior. Here I don't mention not practicing uh, metta because uh, metta is on a very high level, I said in the previous talk. You know, we can practice it, if, but it's very limiting because uh, we haven't developed a state of peace within ourselves. So if we're not promoting these 10 akusala karmas, how can we do metta? Because if we haven't given up killing or stealing or harming, doing these uh, very heavy karmic uh, uh, actions of either body or speech or mind or arguing or, 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 uh, or lying or something like that, we, we, won't, we won't be able to express metta because metta is a, is a state of harmlessness. In a sense, we can see this is where generosity, this quality as they unfold, one petal unfolds, generosity unfolds, generosity from generosity, sila unfolds, from sila unfolding, metta unfolds. So we can see this natural progression because in effect, I was talking with a group of lay people yesterday that when we are generous, our mind, when we give a gift, it's because we're not being incited to do that because we want to give something to someone and our motivations can be varied. Could be, you know, it's our child, we want to make sure they're well. Could be a friend to show how much we love and care for them. Or it can be for the needy. Or it can be just to honour the Triple Gen. And, uh, and the Lord Buddha did uh, uh, say that 
being generous is good. It helps one to let go of one's uh, selfishness and uh, to think about others and it creates a beautiful quality in the mind. And so I did an experiment. I gave, before the talk, I just gave these two young, one young child and a young adult some chocolate they gave me. I said, close your eyes and gave some chocolate. And straight away, I just, just observed their face. It was very, very good quality chocolate. And I could see they were very happy. You know, happy, wow, someone's thinking about me, calling me up, thinking about picking, picking me up, calling me up and wanting to give me a gift. Out of no reason, no reason. I don't even know this monk. Why is he giving me a gift? So there's a smile and the whole audience was smiling. And that's the power. When we, that's a lot of times if we don't get, get, get given gifts much, we don't realise how powerful it is. So when we think of, you know, giving, we're always thinking of giving, oh, should I give this or that? Because we haven't really received much spontaneity. But when we do, we really think, wow, they thought about me. And then what it creates, creates an energy. Wow, I want to think about others. It's promoting that. What it's, what it's inclining to promote is to consider there are other people, not just you, who've got problems, difficulties. Consider that. How can that be? How can I? And when we have that quality of considering, then it's naturally giving this quality of harmlessness. It's not giving any harm or any negativity even though they might create harm or negativity, but we're not, we're not retaliating in that. We're offering, giving that as a gift. And that is what it is. The highest gift of dana is the, one of the highest gifts is giving sila. It's just giving the, 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 the quality of fearlessness to others. So and that's why as we produce, when people who do do a lot of dana are inclined to sila because they can see well, that's, what they, that's what it's actually promoting. That's the end aim, is to promote a sense of I do no harm to myself, do no harm to others, I'm at ease. And then that unfolds into metta, you see. And this is what we can see, this development. So if we're not really doing this natural progression, understanding it, then we're just straight away going into metta. We're going to have a hard time. We're going to have a hard time. So then, uh, as I was saying, uh, people who are you know, really trying to work with the meditation, not considering these uh, fundamental principles of, of Dharma, and this is what uh, giving Dharma talks is all about, to just give refinement, understanding, direction, guidance for the lay people uh, by, uh, by the Buddhist monks. <clears throat> so then these kind of people who haven't developed these qualities of having, having faith, and confidence in the triple gem. And you can see, if you have confidence, what is the first cause for that confidence, conviction, is to give support to that, isn't it? So you can see how dana is a natural consequence of having faith and conviction. Same as when you give a gift to someone, you've got some faith or confidence in that person. Well, that's the reason why you're giving a gift. You know, that's my best friend, it's their birthday. You know, I want to acknowledge our great friendship, I want to you know, make them happy, got faith and confidence in that. But how many people actually give a gift to someone they hate? Yeah. Yeah. We don't do that, don't we? But that's what we should do. So let's say we, have, we had a fight, an argument with someone, the best way to solve that problem is to give them a gift. Oh, by the way, I thought you might like this. You know, it, wonderful, it solves, instead of like if you're going, I'm oh, sorry about arguing, because sometimes the argument's so strong we can't resolve it, it's just egos, it's egos, and with life's full of many different egos. But if we give a gift, it creates this feeling, oh, oh yeah, that'd be great. So it just buffers it, calms it down. And we have that in the Sangha, when monks stay with other monks for a period of time, you know, you know, you know we're all... You know, no, no one's perfect. Even monks, you know, they have the differences. And, and uh, if they've stayed for a period, like a vasa, we do a ceremony asking forgiveness. And it's usually, it's a junior one asked from the senior one. It's just, this, this is the natural tradition. Regardless, if I feel, oh, the senior one should apologise to me, it's just that's not the way it's done in Sangha. Because they're senior, we do it like that. And it's a beautiful, I've seen it when there's been a problem between monks. And the senior one is at the, at the, at the fault. But still, the junior one will go there Instead of saying, you deserve me apology, he'll apologise to him. And he's got nothing to apologise. But what he's apologising is that I had kalesa. I actually, for one moment, had hatred towards you. That's what he's apologising. There's one the level of refinement that we're looking at as Dharma practitioners, even though I have no reason to apologise. But it's wonderful when we give that, it just calms the whole situation down, creates a beautiful, neutral, stable quality, Okay. And thus, um, thus now, 
thus these kind of people never consider gaining confidence in the Lord Buddha who instructed, urge, encourage us to attain inner well-being. The Dharma is for our welfare, benefit and happiness. For understanding ourselves thus, all of us are bound by birth, ageing and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, bound by dukkha and obstructed by dukkha. So this is the fundamental teaching the Lord Buddha gives us to create the sense of harmony. We are all in, in the same boat. We've all got this dilemma. You know, we're all you know, going to come with, meet with death. We're all going to meet with sickness. We're all in the same boat. So why give each other a hard time? Give support. This is what he's saying, encouraging, so we can, so we can uh, let go of uh, this, uh, this, these uh, negativities in the mind and deal with it. Thus, if we do not better ourselves with the Dharma and uh, with the Dharma and true peace of being self-aware and mindful, we can expect to be caught up in the unwholesome flow of negative mind states. Here, with such actions on the level of the mind, greed, hatred and delusion, so these are uh, on the level of the unwholesome mind. And these habitual patterns of the unwholesome mind, greed, hatred, delusion, they're habitual patterns because they uh, belong to the unwholesome mind. They don't belong to you. So when we're feeling greedy, it doesn't belong to you. It's not your mind. It's a habitual pattern belongs to the unwholesome mind. But if we decide to develop the wholesome mind, the good, then those habitual patterns should just fall away because we're promoting something wholesome and it's got no basis when the mind is wholesome. And we can see that when we have a good, peaceful meditation. There's no greed, hatred and delusion. The mind is at peaceful. But as soon as we walk in the kitchen, we're confused. We'll have this, we'll have that, you know, or we'll have a cup of tea because the mind is going outward again. It's lost its basis of peace and it's gone into another, not to another level. You see? You can see the mind has this dynamics. It can choose. The mind can choose. Sometimes to be very kind and sometimes to be very, very nasty. We have that. So we have to be on top of that and see that we have to decide which gear we want to put it in. Okay? So Lord Buddha is constantly empowering us, saying, just look in your mind. You can actually decide, right? You can decide to be happy or not happy. You decided to be unhappy. You can decide. You can change that. So these habitual patterns of unwholesome mind, most common are anger and hostility, the Lord Buddha says. So these are very dangerous. And what, law behold, what is that aiming at? That's aiming at what, again, what I was talking at the very start of the talk, is the development of metta. Because this is what we're looking at, developing metta. You know, this is why we have so much emphasis in the Buddhist world uh, of metta. You know, and, you know, for example, that sutta we're chanting is a classic example. Why we chant? Because this is what we want. This is what we want in the world, you know. You know, if I was to say, uh, hands up, who, who wants more metta in the world or who wants more ill will in the world or, or goodwill, you know, it'd be quite obviously no one would put their hand up saying more ill will, no one. And if that person did, everyone would probably throw them out. <laughs> so, yeah, so we can see like that. And other qualities are denigration, unfairly criticizing someone or something. And uh, again, we can see uh, other ones like insolence, rude, disrespectful behavior. And this again, showing no, 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 no development in, uh, in the wholesome qualities of body, speech, and mind. And miserly stinginess is the last one. So, this one. Uh, Again, looking at the fundamental aspect of Buddhism, which is generosity. So there are all these factors. You can see how they very much go in the other way, right? I did gave a talk about a month ago on particular this theme of working with good and bad, but that's, this, this talk's not about that. It's just showing someone who, dis, who has no development in their Buddhist practice, giving a bit of a perspective there. So not just talking just purely about how meta, how great it is, but also saying, well, there's this quality, we don't have it, and why is that, and how can we build up onto it? So that's a very important point. This is the work and the domain. So we're seeing that uh, noble states such as these, they arise, um, and, uh, well, I would say ignoble states, or those of unwholesome states, and uh, if we see them as they arise, then truly they are dependent on conditions, as I was saying before. It's a decision we make. If we're generating these negative qualities, then we're just going to produce more negative qualities. This is the work and the domain of the wholesome mind. So this is meaning that uh, to see that they are dependent on conditions. So the wholesome mind can see that. 
and, and, and thus it's inclined to the qualities of loving kindness, compassion, uh, sympathetic joy or harmonizing, as I like to say, and equanimity. So when we have that, then it's, it's, it's going in that, that, that direction. The mind is saying, no, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to go that way. I don't want to think those thoughts. And, uh, and the reason why it's doing that is because there's enough mindfulness established in the mind to see something's not right, behavior's not right. This is not my normal mode of behavior. So that's, that's a beautiful. If we've been promoted since a young age, like the Lord Buddha says, this sutta is aimed at young children. You know, then uh, then uh, it shows that they can develop very to a very advanced level, <clears throat> which has the ability. So, um, so inclining to these states um, has the ability to, to abandon unwholesome states. Thus, uh, if we lack these four Brahma Viharas, then we won't know right from wrong, and for oneself, uh, we'll be caught in these wrong deeds of body, speech, and mind. So if we're deprived of uh, sympathetic joy, or I like to say harmonizing uh, with others, evil envy or being jealous is a consequence. I've talked about that in previous talks, but I'll just go on a, some uh, very uh, a standard statement the Lord Buddha has for jealousy. And what is evil envy? Here a householder or a householder's son is prosperous of wealth, grain, silver and gold. He, and he might have a slave or someone dependent on him might think of him, oh, may my master, this household is thinking, or the household of sons thinking that, may my master not be prosper, not uh, have wealth in grain, gold, and silver. So, and again, this is very ancient. You know, it's talking about having a slave and something dependent on it. So that's in the, in the ancient time, a rich, wealthy family would have their own entourage of uh, slaves and entourage of servants, and it would be okay. It's part of their their right, and because uh, and that was part of society then, and even Lord Buddha saw that and didn't interfere. He was not, you know, he was in the main thing he says, uh, he, a main uh, thing that he was pointing at was spiritual development for all, 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 all sentient beings, was not being a, a socialist or, you know, trying to promote communism or this or that. So he understood there was a lot of suffering, a lot of wrong things in the world, but he did not teach in um, Brahmic language, which was, uh, which was uh, he taught in uh, Magadha Pali, which was a language of the local people. So all the local people, even the uneducated, could speak this language. And this is what the Pali is coded in, this beautiful language, which, which is universal language. It, it reaches all the classes, even the outcasts of uh, India. So there's four classes in India. There's the a, a Katyas, the Brahmins, the, Vesas and uh, and the suttas, which are they are the the, the 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 working class or the rough ones, as they say, who whose speech is not very etiquette. And you can see that for our tradies, you know, they're always, <laughs> oh my gosh, the tradies here, oh my god, the speech is pretty coarse. <laughs> so it's very, it's, as it was back then, it's same as our present time, and and we can see all these uh, connections. The merchant class is probably more people in executive or in management positions and things like that, where they wear a you know, tie and collar and their etiquette's a bit more, you know, much more refined because they're involved with uh, human resources and administration, things like that. So we can see these qualities are lapping over in modern society. There's still these, in a way, these four classes which were in traditional India. And of course the outcasts, which are street people, and that exists even now today. So it'll reach all those people, Pali, so that is wonderful. So then, you know, the Lord is saying, well, if you're a slave or someone underneath that, you shouldn't think like that. Just because you're, you know, you don't have much wealth or things like that, you should not think like that. That is unwholesome. And uh, even though it's unjust, your lot in life. But we can consider, what if we were to say, may I be content with what I have and work towards bettering myself and harmonizing with others? does not arise in a mind on that occasion. So these kinds of thoughts don't arise. So then, you know, it's their fault. You know, for example, you know, we have a menial job. We're jealous of someone who's got, you know, very good quality of life and things like that, drives a Mercedes. It's because of their good merits, good karma, hard work, luck, whatever, you know. Why should you be bothered by that? Is it going to make your life any happier being jealous? It just makes you more miserable. It creates what it, this, uh, this negativity in the mind. This is why the Dharma is so beautiful, because it's, it's 
it's spotless and pure. It's got nothing to do with all the social politic problems of the world. But because it has nothing to do with that, it can resolve all those problems of the world in a very beautiful way without actually, you know, creating any, any need to do anything. It's just as people develop their Dharma practice, this will be evident. There was a famous slave girl at the time, the Buddha. She had an excellent memory and she memorized many suttas. And uh, she, with conversations with Pra Ananda Tera, she would recite those suttas. And now we have them. And they're all named after her. The, the book is named after her out of remembrance and respect for her. Because Ananda c collected all the suttas, as we know, and compiled them in the first uh, gathering of the Sangha with Mahakasapa. So that's why we have that intact the Pali Canon as it is. Uh, so we have great gratitude to Mahakasapa who decided to do that special event in the cave in Kitaguj in uh, Rajagrut, which I went last year, a very powerful place. Mm. So as we see thus being based in these unwholesome states of existence, uh, we blow our trumpet and, and we say it's impossible to abandon such um, conduct, you know. And this is the thing, we say, no, it's normal, I, I do like this. And it's because we're used to behaving un, in an unwholesome way that we see no benefit in doing meta and all that. But slowly, if we get in contact with that, that, we get curious and slowly we start to change, saying, oh, this is really interesting, generosity, sila, meta, this is all very interesting. Mm, I might try to do that and see what effect. And slowly one starts to develop, you know, going that direction. So... Th this being the uh, this kind of person is based in the in greed, hatred, and delusion, and this is the domain of evil desire. And finally, Lord Buddha says he gives a good, beautiful simile for evil desire, a positive and negative polarity, how we can work with it. And what is evil desire? Here, one is without faith, desires not to have faith. Let them know me. One is endowed with faith, does not arise in the mind, and does not grow in whole wholesome wholesome desires nor positive mind states of loving kindness compassion harmonizing with others and equanimity and so uh so this we can see this uh one aspect you know we are seeing that uh he is without it and that desires to uh does not have desire to have faith does not desire to go that way even though there's that potential to be endowed with faith, endowed with confidence and develop that, one has no desire to go in that direction. And this is what evil desire is. It's pulling us down. It's pulling us from the potential growth in wholesome states. And an immoral person, here, one without virtue, desires not to have virtue. Let them know me as virtuous. Does not arise in a mind. And this is a, the Lord Buddha says, this is a turning point where we decide ourselves, motivate ourselves, that this is a good thing. I want to start promoting that. And this is what happens. People just decide they want to start meditating. Even though it's difficult in the beginning, they start, they start to do a little bit of meditation, they get some benefits, and then they find more group seats. And this is that inner quality where we're transforming from the unwholesome. This is that fundamental principle of chanda, desire, wholesome desire. And it says, this is what we're working with. We're working with this very raw material, which can be very potential lethal and, and, uh, and dark. Desire can be like that, because that's pretty much uh, tanha, leads to uh, attachment, leads to a much more, more pain and misery and a lot, a lot of problems. But also there's a tanha going out that way. We're going with, we, we're actually like a fork in a road. It's the same road, but it forks off. One's, one's going unwholesome, one's going wholesome. And doing that, the mind is getting strength and developing insight and, and uh, purity. There's potentially uh, development there. Here, one with little learning desires not to study and practice a dharma. Let them know me as learned does not arise in the mind. And then one who delights in company desires not to be uh, solitary, to be alone. And this uh, not to be alone, uh, secluded from unwholesome states. That's where I, 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 I interfere there because uh, a lot of people say, oh, why, do you, why are you such a loner? Why don't you enjoy our company, enjoy our friends? This is not the point. What it's saying is that in certain times as a Dharma practitioner, we will seek a quiet place to develop already this good foundation of wholesome qualities. So we need that quiet space. And what the Lord Buddha is saying, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, um, one, one, one goes into a deep state of concentration because there's nothing to interfere with the mind. The mind goes into a deeper state. It's ready. 
So that's what it's promoting that. So if uh, we can be still with a group of people, it's just our behavior. So I've talked to a lot of teachers about this in Thailand. So it's not necessarily meaning to be alone, but our behavior, our conduct is like we're there, but we're alone. You see, we're contained. When we're contained and very developed in our, in, our, in our qualities, composure, contained, we feel we're in a group, but we feel alone. Like here now, we're sitting, meditating. We feel alone. We're in a group, but we also feel quite alone because you don't know the people and stuff like that, and you're just here now, contained. So it's a beautiful quality of developing this inner uh, peace and uh, a reflection on dharma and so forth. <clears throat> One who is lazy desires not to be energetic. Let them know me as energetic. Energetic does not arise in the mind. One who is muddled mind desires not to be mindful. Let them know me as mindful does not arise in the mind. One who is unconcentrated desires not to be concentrated. Let them know me as concentrated does not arise in the mind. One who is unwise desires not to understand Dharma. Let them know me as wise does not arise in the mind. One who, whose taints, and the highest one, of course, is one who has the taints that are not destroyed, desires not to be free of sensuality, the fever and the lust that comes from sensuality, becoming the agitation and wanting more and more that comes with becoming, and ignorance, the distracted states that are ever seeking this and that. So these are the three fundamental principles that are keeping us in a state of non-development. These are the very asavas. These are the, the most heaviest, hardest. They're the, they're the, they're the uh, what you call the heavyweight killers, it's heavyweight defilements of the mind. So that's the last one, and that's why it says, our Aharon has completely abolished these three states. They don't exist in the mind. There's no more, there's no more fever for sensuality. And no more becoming, no more agitation in the mind, irritations of any sort. And there's no more ignorance, you know, where there's, uh, where we just, we're always constantly going to this distracted state. You can see yourself. If you try to just focus your mind, how difficult it is. That's because of ignorance. It's the power of ignorance. That is, if you want to really understand ignorance on a very fundamental aspect, it's because the mind cannot focus on a wholesome object like the breath. Stay with the breath. It gets, it gets gets pulled in other things so we can see uh, when we're working med meditation we're saying we're saying fundamentally uh, desire to be free of these qualities that's what we're working towards and we're improving and we're seeing getting much more happiness because the mind is getting this sense of containment and strength within itself so uh, this again is mostly these problems why we don't have this desire or this does not arise in a mind, this kusala chanda arise in a mind. Uh, as J Lord of Buddha talks about many, on many occasions that it's because we are associating with fools and we become fools. The Lord of Buddha recommended us to associate with the wise, having good friendship, kalena mita is a famous term. And what is good friendship? Here in whatever village or town a clansman, he associates with a household or, or their sons whether young but of mature, vicious, uh, whether young but mature, not vicious at all, but having virtuous qualities, or whether old um, but also of mature status, having virtuous qualities. So it just shows that someone with wisdom is not necessarily just in the domain of someone who's got a lot of life experience. You think, oh, how can a child be wise and intelligent? You know, he's only a little boy. But Lord Buddha says, don't, don't differentiate, because it is potential that young children have uh, accumulated palmaries from the past and, uh, and qualities that we've seen, such as uh, young teenagers in Sri Lanka chanting all the suttas by memory without even even looking at a book. And why is that? Their mind has got all this stored great um, karmic good qualities from the past, that it's so strong that they memorize, it just comes out, you know, they start chanting, they record it, it's quite amazing. It just shows the power of the mind to able to store that from one transmigrating from one, from one life to another. So that's wonderful to see. So with these virtuous qualities, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we look into uh, uh, their accomplishments in faith, in confidence, in virtuous behavior, in generosity and wisdom. 
he converses with them, engages in discussion with them. So it might be an elderly man talking with a young child about you know, wisdom and seeing the child is very intelligent. Oh, you know so much about Dharma, that's amazing. And he's learning from him. And there might be a child learning from man. This is, this is how we are as a Dharma practice. We're not conceited saying, oh, how can he know more than me? But it's good to just sometimes be open to other people. And it's just being a neutral conversation, enjoying uh, the sharing of uh, one's reflections and how one Dharma practice is going and their, one's insights. And this is what Lord Buddha is clearly saying. This is, this is very positive, good karma to do that. And then in so far as the accomplishment in, in their qualities of confidence, virtuous behavior, generosity, and wisdom, he emulates, aspires, matches them with the respect of these accomplishments. So this is what, again, desires. They see this wholesome desire to improve oneself, to better oneself. So if we associate with people of very good quality, then we will aspire to do that. And I was talking with the group yesterday about uh, a young lady who's studying pharmacology, and, uh, and uh, if she hangs around with mechanics, Will she improve a better self as a pharmacologist? No way. You know, she's, got, she's hanging around with mechanics. They're going to be talking about you know, monkey grease business. You know? And she goes back to school. She goes, oh, what's this? What's that? You know, you know, this is a grease gun. No, it's, what are you talking about, a grease gun? This is pharmacology. This is a needle. <laughs> you know, it just shows. That's a very extreme example just to create a very powerful picture. This is how it is. If we associate with certain people, that just really brings the mind down. If you associate with bright, happy people, it brings the mind up. That's why people are attracted to the center, because it brightens us up. We've got something to brighten us up, to give us a bit of life, give us zest, give us a bit of motivation. And this is what it is. Lord Buddha is always aiming at motivating people. There's an underlying tendency in motivating, prodding people. Go on, you can do it. Encourage, arouse, you know, and, and like, like so. So uh, with these qualities, uh, matching these qualities of confidence, virtuous uh, qualities, generosity, wisdom, uh, a woman or a man developed in this liberation of mind of, by loving kindness, compassion, harmonizing with others, equanimity, a woman or a man cannot take this body with them when they go. Mortals have their mind as their core. So again, this is uh, showing uh, the high level of development where one is not born again in any womb is the last statement of the Karina Metta Sutta. And that is again connecting with this other sutta, saying that once we've developed on this generosity, sila, metta, and established, really established in it, we just keep on developing, deepening it to its very, very powerful state of being, then um, it will naturally, that person won't incline to come back to the sensual realm, because that is going away from sensuality. So people say, oh, metta, you know, it's very lovey and things like that. But actually, what I was saying in the very beginning of the talk, metta is a very deep, peaceful state. It's not how we see metta on a normal mind level, where we say, oh, this poor thing, I feel sorry for it. When we feel like that, we're creating a relationship. We're, we're creating a preference. When we're creating a preference, then we'll say, oh, this poor thing. And let's say the dog bit the, the snake, and we're saying, no, you bad dog. You see, we're creating a preference for the snake, saying, oh, the poor snake. So this is the bad guy, this is the good guy. This is how, on the, on the normal level of the mind, how it functions, the Lord Buddha says. But on a level of metta, it will just see that situation. I've talked with another great Ajahn. He saw a fight between two uh, animals, which I saw on my deep in the forest and ding, a snake and a gecko, which is this giant lizard, and they both are arch enemies. And they were fighting, and I was just sitting in meditation watching it. Now I felt like intervening, I felt like stopping them, pulling up, but I thought, no, this is, this is the nature of the animal world, I'm not going to get involved. And they were fighting it, and it went on for hours and hours, and the snake coiled itself around them, the gecko, and it was struggling, it was suffocating, and it started, started to swallow it and eat it. And I was just watching it, meditating, watching it, saying, it's just very sad, very sad. This world is so sad, you know. Life is so, you know, hard to attain peace. That realm is so sad, they have to kill each other, you know. It's so sad, you know. And they're not angry, it's just for food. Just to bear necessity of life. This is the fact of life. A snake has to eat a living animal. It, if you give it dead meat, it's not interested. It wants fresh, lively kill. That's how it has to eat. It's not interested. And we just got to accept that's the nature of that animal has to live like that. And to me, it was a very profound effect on the mind. I had to step back, and I felt this quality of this karuna, not really worldly compassion, but on a very lokutra compassion. 
And this is what I think what the Lord was, Lord was implying about when he saw the old man, the uh, aged person, the person dying. He saw these powerful things. And he wasn't saying, oh, this poor old man. You've got to remember, the Lord Buddha never saw an old man, a sick man, a, a, a dead person, and uh, these uh, free people, uh, and also uh, a, 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 a somebody meditating. That was the fourth one, the fourth Devata Dutta he saw. Somebody meditating underneath a tree, um, uh, another ascetic or so forth. This is when he was a young prince. And he had tears on his face. All night he could not sleep. He was thinking, oh, how... Terrible dilemma, you know, terrible dilemma what we're in. And then, and then he had this deep insight. If there is a condition, there must be the unconditioned. If there is a born, there must be the unborn. He's not saying, oh, how can I uh, help that person get better? He's sick. Or how can I make that old person uh, young again? He went to the deep root and that insight. He saw that I, too, am of that state. And his driver, Chanda, was driving. He said, and Chanda sees this all the time because he's a, you know, a local working class boy. His driver, Chanda, the famous charioteer of the Lord Buddha, says, oh, it's normal. People get sick. It's normal. People, people die. It's normal. And I'm like, what? Oh, what? He was horrified. He was horrified. He was horrified. And this is what we're looking at is that when we're developing these qualities, if we do sitting somewhere meditating, we do see animals fighting like I did, we're horrified. This is the state of the, what we're living in. We're living in this existence. I really felt I had the same insight that the Lord Buddha had, pretty much, in that level through my Dharma practice. And this is the thing, this shows you that's how valuable the Lord Buddha's teaching is. If we don't have this in the world and we're not teaching this, people's minds won't incline to investigate it. And it is on a level potential in each human mind to investigate, to get that level of metta, karuna, mutita, upeka, to that high level and to see it, it's lokutara going to the world of anagami, which is a non-returner. And then from that level, attain arahantship. And this is what the sutra is based on children. So I won't go into my final notes because I've still got a video to play on young children meditating who are not Buddhist. And this is a very interesting video. Okay. So yeah, it's just wonderful to see. There's a few bit of elements there that are pointing from my talk. So I thought it was uh, very fitting. Um, of course, the idea is not to entertain, watch TV. Let's hey, let's, let's kick back and watch some TV. <laughs> it's just to find something very uh, something I can't uh, add, adds to the talk. Just want to stay. So there's quite a lot of interesting things on YouTube, which we can uh, see. That's wonderful. There's a lot of even though there's a lot of negativity in the world, there's a lot of good coming as well and this is the beauty of of the Lord Buddha's teachings that able to live at ease and peace with all this chaotic world that we live in and still develop uh, the quality of a beautiful white lotus that comes out of the mucky depths of a swamp uh, unblemished untouched by the swampy depths and it's just the this is the this is the most beautiful uh, state of our mind when our mind has reached these uh, very beautiful states we are surrounded by uh, dirty things and people not so nice and this and that, but we're not spoiled by that, not touched by that. But we're adding a sense of giving something back. So that whole beautiful swamp area with the lotus, are just, just looking at that lotus saying how beautiful it is. It's really worthwhile to just be, we're all together in it together and, uh, and uh, we all have that potential to be like that white, white lotus. So it's just a matter of time. So. So I'll give you uh, my words for your reflection and, uh, and the more than enough for coming for this Sunday talk.